Okay, so let me go ahead. I'm going to introduce Julia, who we are happy to have here today. Um, let me find my notes here. So Julia, she's a New York Times bestselling author. And today we're going to be talking about her most latest book, which was a New York Times book review editor's choice and a finalist for a California Book Award. Um, she has also written um, two other nonfiction books, Lost Kingdom, Hawaii's Last Queen, The Sugar Kings, and America's First Imperial Adventure, and also The House of Mondavi, which the rise and fall of an American wine dynasty, which is a finalist for a James Beard Foundation Book Award and a Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Reporting. She's also a veteran journalist and a longtime contributor and former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. And she's been a guest commentator on CNBC, CNN, and the BBC. So we're really fortunate to have her with us today. She's also a resident of the Bay Area, which it's always nice to have a local author. And so we're really pleased to have her here. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to Julia and um, thank you, get started. Hey everybody, Stacy. first of all, thank you so much for this invitation to join you today. I really appreciate uh, being here and look forward to the chance to answer some questions afterwards. Uh, so. What I'm going to tell you about today is a true story about a path-breaking project that began in San Francisco 148 years ago and continues today. This story is about a pioneering group of women who fought sex slavery in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century and the key role that education played in the struggle for freedom. So I spent five years working at UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library, Stanford Special Collections Library, the National Archives, and a whole bunch of other places, including Scotland, uh, tracking down descendants and traveling across the country and the world to piece together the history of these pioneering activists. And my hope is that what I discovered has resonance in our world today and might be inspiring to you. So I'm gonna show you some historical images. Many of them came from the San Francisco Public Library's absolutely wonderful history room. If you haven't visited that, go there right now. It is such a treasure. I spent a lot of time there and got to know the wonderful librarians there. Um, but let me uh, pull up my screen, if I may, give me a second. There we go. Okay, let's get to, oops, I'm having a trouble getting it next. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, everybody, it's taking a little longer. Oops, jumped ahead. Huh. Sorry about this. Okay, let's start here then. So the story begins, the story that my book, The White Devil's Daughters, uh, tells begins in the 1870s in San Francisco. And I want to start by setting the stage for you what the city was like then. Um, there were cable cars rumbling up the city's hills in the summer of 1873. The streets are lit by gas lamps. Many of the streets are cobblestoned. There's continual construction and change in the city of San Francisco, much like uh, what we're seeing in the Bay Area today. There was also, during that period of time, tremendous anti-Asian agitation and violence. Again, like the kind of anti-Asian violence we're seeing right now. Now, uh, the gold rush had ended two decades earlier and the Chinese who worked the mines and laid railroad uh, across the West um, often came to settle in San Francisco, which was then the capital of Chinese America. And San Francisco itself remained a very rough port town with its infamous Barbary Coast Vice District uh, and, of course, Chinatown. As one uh, newspaper reporter uh, wrote, it was a town of men and taverns and boarding houses and billiard saloons. It was the cussedest place for women. Now, one of the most cussedest places for women was San Francisco's Chinatown. And in those days, it was a very densely packed ghetto in the heart of the city, of course, centered around 
Portsmouth Square just like it is today. There were roughly 12,000 people squeezed into eight square blocks. And the vast majority of those people were men uh, who had left their families back in China. Sorry, my slides are a little bit mixed up. These are the cable cars that started in 1873. I do apologize. And uh, this uh, is the slide that I usually use to illustrate the notion of the, you know, the custodious place for women. I love this photograph, which comes from the San Francisco history collection and the woman's face in the foreground. Um, now, as I mentioned, it was uh, Chinatown particularly was a place with vast majority men and many of them had left their families back in Chinatown or in China, sorry. And there was, as I said before, tremendous anti-Asian violence as you can probably see uh, on the corner, one of the signs are, say, no Chinese cheap labor for us. And this is an illustration of uh, the famous riots that took place in the early 1870s known as the Sandlot Riots. And what you're seeing in the background is what was then San Francisco's uh, city hall. So there were a huge number of brothels in Chinatown in response to the demand from, for sex uh, in this raucous town of men. Uh, and the demand came from both Chinese and white men. And the vast majority of girls and women who lived in Chinatown in the 1860s and 1870s, at least according to the city census takers at the time, were designated as prostitutes. Now, a few of them may have chosen that work, but the vast majority were tricked or sold or forced into it. And many were very, very young, 12, 13, 14 years old, and the conditions were brutal. They didn't live very, very long. This is a photograph, a famous photograph of a Chinese prostitute uh, in the 19th century in San Francisco. And it's hard to tell how old she is, but she looks young. This is another iconic photograph, again, from the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley of what was then known as a Chinese slave girl. Uh, again, this is a very young girl, uh, perhaps 12 years old. Now, Congress, let's just remember, Congress had passed the 13th Amendment towards the end of the Civil War, and that amendment was aimed at ending the slavery of African Americans. Yet, in San Francisco, there were open auctions of Asian girls and women on the streets of the city. The news, how do I know this? Well, the newspapers reported that this was happening and there was a great public outcry. So as a result, these auctions of human beings moved to more private places, including one that was known as the Queen's Room. Uh, and of course it wasn't a Queen's Room at all. It was more like a corral uh, for young girls. Now, who these girls were being trafficked for the most part by criminal gangs from China. Uh, and the support for trafficking for this very lucrative business of human trafficking came from white San Francisco officials. But many people across the West were profiting from this business. This brings me to my next slide. And the plight of these girls and women who were being trafficked from Asia into the West Coast and particularly San Francisco came to the attention first of the wives of Christian missionaries who were working in Chinatown. And they held one of their first meetings at Calvary Presbyterian, which was then a newly built church about six blocks away from Union Square. Um, and the idea that was sparked at that meeting was that these women would somehow try to fight the social injustice of sexual slavery and human trafficking. And that was an idea that was way, way ahead of its time. Uh, but even then, Calvary Presbyterian had a reputation for civic activism. And so that very small group of women rallied a, a mostly um, a, another, a large, slightly larger group of mostly middle-class women. And they decided the best thing they could do was to set up a safe house. Uh, and they, they recruited a few well-known backers such as Phoebe Apperson Hurst, who of course was the mother of the great media magnate, uh, uh, William Randolph Hurst. And the wife as well as of George, George Hurst who made his fortune in mines and went on to become a Senator. 
Uh, so Phoebe Hurst was an early backer of this project. Um, but just consider what the background was for um, this idea of these activists. This was a time in the late 19th century when women did not have the right to vote and they had little economic or political power on their own. Uh, yet they managed to raise the money to acquire uh, what is here, which is a very large home on Sacramento Street. Uh, and it opened its doors. Actually, it was initially a little apartment across the street that opened its doors in 1874 as a, a safe house. And to give you some context, that's 15 years before Hull House in Chicago, who would, which was made famous by the, uh, the social, social worker Jane Addams, opened its doors. So our own, San Francisco's own safe house uh, started up way before Hull House did. And this um, organization, they moved from the apartment into this big house and this organization ended up operating as a safe house for seven decades from the 1870s through the 1930s. And the women who ran the home uh, began doing what they called rescue work. Now that's a term we probably wouldn't use today. It's a little old fashioned and it seems to kind of strip the agency away from the girls and the women who'd been trafficked. But this was a photograph that was taken to demonstrate the work. And I like to show it um, any, even though it was probably staged for the newspapers at the time. Uh, and what you see here uh, is, a young girl, you can see her, she's in the arms of a policeman. Her face is averted from the camera. Standing on the ladder is almost certainly a police detective uh, who was in part of the Chinatown squad, might have been the leader of the Chinatown squad at that point. And standing below is the superintendent of the home, uh, probably the best known superintendent who served for many decades was known as Donaldina Cameron. And that certainly is Donaldina Cameron uh, looking at the camera there. Um, but the person you can't see is just as important. She's standing next to Donaldina. She's looking up at the trafficked girl. And almost certainly she was one of the Chinese women who was working side by side uh, in this safe house and often would be the very first point of contact for the trafficked girls and women because she could speak to uh, that girl or that woman in her own uh, dialect of Chinese. So uh, that is a very important person. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things that I learned about this story is that the white women and the Chinese women worked together for decades to run this home and raise awareness of the issue of human trafficking. So uh, we know uh, through logbooks and case files that between 2,000 and 3,000 residents stayed at the home between the 1870s and the 1930s. Um, this is the way the home looks today. And it had a number of names over the years. Uh, this is one of the names, the Occidental Board Presbyterian Mission House. And that's, that's exactly what it looks like at 920 Sacramento Street today. I suspect uh, some of you have already been there or perhaps know it quite well. Uh, and those 2,000 to 3,000 residents um, ranged in age from young babies to children to women in their 20s and 30s. And some of the babies, of course, were born to residents um, who had been forced into prostitution. Others were orphans who were left in the care of the home. In the 1870s and the 1880s, there was not that much of a social services safety net in San Francisco. Um, so the safe house provided that function uh, and it was very early in doing so. And the women who ran the home hoped to share their Christian faith with the women and the girls who came through it. Uh, but conversion to Christianity was not a requirement for uh, staying at the safe house. So I'm gonna go back to a photograph I showed you a little bit earlier. I'm just gonna jump back here. I can get it. One more. Ah, there we go. Okay, so it was a small 
band of faith-based activists, Asian and white, who fought, fought the slave trade from San Francisco for seven decades together. And while 920 Sacramento Street in San Francisco was their base, they traveled around the country on cases involving trafficking, which is really, really fascinating from New York to Chicago to the Midwest, um, up to Portland and Seattle as well. Uh, this group of women were always short of money, yet to me, it's really remarkable how much they achieved. They raised awareness of the issue of human trafficking. They testified in front of legislators. They helped pass one of the first pieces of anti-trafficking legislation in the state of California. And they hosted an enormous number of VIPs over the years, including a presidential party and the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie and his wife. And the person who became the public face of the home is pictured here in this photograph, which comes from the California State Library and was taken by a very gifted photographer and journalist named Louis Stellman. Uh, and the public face is sitting in the center with the Gibson girl bun. Uh, she's not looking directly at the camera and her name, as I mentioned before, was Donaldina Cameron. And her Scottish family called her Dolly. Let's jump ahead to uh, another picture of her. Oops, can't find it. Sorry, everybody. My slides are a little mixed up right now. Anyways, let's go back. I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Donaldina Cameron. So she was so effective at disrupting the business of human trafficking that her enemies in Chinatown, again, these are primarily organized crime gangs, uh, called her the white devil. And that's where the title of my book comes from. Uh, of course, that's a racial epithet. And it was meant to scare girls away from seeking refuge in the home. They, the owners of those girls wanted to prevent them from seeking her out. At the same time, some of the girls and the women in the home called her low mo or mother. And one of the most touching uh, discoveries I made in the Stanford archives was of Mother's Day cards uh, from uh, women who had passed through the home and moved to places all over the world, back, some back to China, some to New York, some elsewhere. Um, and these were Mother's Day cards they sent Donald, Donaldina or Dolly Cameron. So Dolly and her team of women staffers faced many threats and challenges over the years, including, of course, the quarantine of Chinatown for bubonic plague at the, right at the turn of the 20th century. But there was probably no challenge that was greater than what happened on the morning of April 18th, 1906. This was a photograph taken that morning on Sacramento Street, and the house is actually about 50 yards away from where the photographer was standing on the left. Um, now, there were about 50 people living in the home at that time, and it was really Dolly's first person account of leading the girls and the women through the destroyed streets. Um, I almost could feel the smell of smoke in the air that first drew me uh, to this story. I was fascinated by the grit and the resilience of those 50 50 individuals, those 50 girls and women, and one case baby, and another case grandmother. How did they make it? They all survived. This is another photograph taken from on top of a Knob Hill looking down towards the home. Chinatown, as you probably know, was almost completely destroyed by the earthquake and fire. Here we have uh, Donaldina Cameron uh, in the center again with her Gibson girl bun, uh, surrounded by some of those uh, uh, residents of the home, including a few staffers. So one of the most remarkable people to come through the home that I, I discovered um, was a, a woman named Bessie John. And uh, Bessie Zhang had fled an arranged marriage in China by running away to the home at age 15. And it quickly became clear to staffers that she had a very gifted mind. Uh, 
And with their help, she became the first Chinese American woman to graduate from Stanford. She graduated in 1927. And this is her yearbook photograph that I found at the Stanford archives. Um, and she then went on to medical school and became a pioneering Chinese American female doctor. And she eventually returned to San Francisco and helped to care for the youngest residents of the home. By the time she did this, there were actually, there was a, a separate home set, set up. There was the original safe house on Sacramento Street. And then there was a, a home for younger residents as well. Now here is another woman who came through the home. And in fact, she was an earthquake refugee. She was one of the young girls who joined Dolly um, and escaped the home and uh, traveled by ferry to uh, eventually to San Rafael um, right after the earthquake. Uh, and her name was Tai Leong. And she's pictured here behind the wheel of this car. And she was sold by her family as a child servant. Uh, she ran away to the rescue home at the age of 12 to avoid um, an arranged marriage that she didn't want to enter. And uh, just like Bessie, she gained education at the home. She became a translator and an aide and eventually the first Chinese American woman to work at Angel Island when it opened in 1910. And she, her story is so remarkable. She fell in love with the fellow worker at Angel Island. And uh, this, he was a white man. And in California at that time, it was illegal for uh, Asian people to marry white people. And so they went to Washington state to get married where it was legal. And they came back and they promptly both lost their jobs. Um, they were remarkably resilient people and they bounced back and found other opportunities. And the, this is a newspaper photo of uh, Tai, Tai, and it, the caption for it was that she was a progressive Chinese American woman who cast a vote in a presidential primary in 1912. So indeed, she was one of the early women to vote. And she'd been America, uh, born in America. But one thing you might not realize looking at this photograph is that she never learned how to drive at all. This was completely staged uh, for the newspapers. Now, um, this is another woman who passed through the home right around the turn of the 20th century. And just to take a step back, one of the challenges of writing this history was that few women who uh, had or have been trafficked left written records behind. Um, and this woman was an exception. And that's why I was so overjoyed to learn more about her story. Uh, she ended up writing very movingly of the experience of finding safety at the safe house in San Francisco. And her, she had a number of names, but um, she was best known as Yamada Waka. She was a Japanese woman. She had been trafficked through Seattle and then ended up down in San Francisco. And she turned, took refuge at the home at the turn of the century. And she gained an education there like the other women I mentioned. Uh, she ended up marrying her Japanese tutor that the home had connected her with. And the couple returned to Japan. And there Yamada Waka ended up becoming a leading feminist writer. And she in fact set up a safe house that was modeled on 920 Sacramento Street in San Francisco. Um, this photograph uh, comes from the Library of Congress and is so remarkable. It was taken in 1937 and Yamada Waka was on a book tour and she had just met Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady. And again, she, her story is an example of grit and resilience and the role that education can play in turning somebody's life around. Ah, there's Dali as a very young person. These slides are surprising me. I'm not exactly sure why they're coming up the way they are, but uh, Dolly is in the back row, and this is before she joined uh, the safe house in 1895 uh, when she was 25 years old. Oh, and there she is at 25 years old. Uh, right, probably this photograph was taken before she started work, and I never again saw her in such delicate, ladylike clothes. You know, after that, she wore very practical dark clothes and rolled up her sleeves and uh, you know, she went straight to work and she was known for her 
physical courage and her spirit. You know, she, uh, she would scrabble over roofs and do whatever needed to take to uh, help uh, vulnerable girls and women. Oh, there's another photograph. This is surprising me. I'm not sure what's what's showing up in this slideshow. Um, but this is her much later. This is, you can tell from the photograph, it's probably around 1908. Uh, the house at 920 Sacramento Street has been rebuilt. That's Joyce Alley next to it. Uh, and it's still, you know, it's still the early days of reconstructing Chinatown after uh, the earthquake. But there she, that was the kind of clothing she would wore, wear going forward. Very, very practical, very Victorian era as well. Now, another woman I'd like to tell you about, um, and a woman who came to call Dolly Cameron mother was uh, a young girl named Tian Fu Wu. And she arrived at the house in 1894, uh, shortly before Dolly got there. She'd been sold by her father in China when she was a young girl uh, to pay his gambling debts. And she ended up in a brothel in San Francisco um, in the 18, early 1890s uh, at around eight years of age. And uh, she was not a prostitute, of course. She was a child servant working in that brothel at that time. But uh, she went through a series of owners and one of the owners really abused her, uh, physically tortured her. And her abuse came to the attention of um, policemen. And so the policemen brought her over to the safe house at 920 Sacramento Street. And um, uh, anyways, she, uh, she was a, another remarkable young woman. She uh, managed to uh, get a college education with the help of the home. And uh, that was, um, uh, very, very unusual at that time. And uh, she did eventually go back uh, to China to look for her mother and grandmother, but had no look, luck, you know, kind of tracking them down. So she realized that the closest thing she had to a family was uh, the women at uh, 920 Sacramento Street. So she decided to go back and work there as a staffer. And that's exactly what she did. And she spent the next three decades there working side by side with Dolly Cameron. And uh, Dolly and Tin became uh, great colleagues, um, great friends. Uh, they trusted each other um, implicitly. And when Dolly, Dolly really did a lot of fundraising and a lot of traveling. And so Tin was her second, second in command. I mean, she ran the house in Dolly's absence. She would go, she would stage rescues on her own. Um, so one of the great joys for me of writing this book was to uncover Tian's story and try to tell it. Uh, she wasn't a famous person, um, although Dolly did suggest she take over the home when Dolly uh, retired. Uh, Tian deferred and said, no, thank you. I, I don't think I would be very effective as a Chinese person. And this was in the 1930s. And Tian well knew that part of the job of the superintendent of the home was to go out there and raise money. Uh, so I don't think she wanted to do that. So anyways, I have, why, as I mentioned, I went many places to report and research this book. And one of those places was Evergreen Cemetery in Los Angeles. Uh, and this is where I found the gravestones of Dolly Cameron and Tian Fu Wu. And they are in the same family plot the Cameron family plot. Uh, and I love showing these gravestones because it reminds us how really close this history is to us. Now, Dolly was born in 1869, but she only died in 1968. Uh, Tien uh, died in 1975. So in both cases, I was able to interview people who remembered uh, Miss Cameron and remembered Auntie Wu. Um, and that was really a delight. Uh, because it felt close. It felt very close. I could walk where they had walked. I could see the rooms where they had lived and worked um, and try to reconstruct their lives. This is a picture of the two of them as well. There's Dolly again. She always wore her hair in that bun. Tien is on the other side of the, the woman. Um, and this is a little bit later in their lives. Don't know where that photograph is from. Well, anyways, 
Uh, it's been a great um, uh, honor to tell you this story. I really hope that you have some questions for me uh, about it. Uh, I've only been able to touch on a few aspects of, of the story as a whole, um, but one of the great pleasures for me has been, you know, getting to meet some of the descendants, for example, uh, uh, Ty's grandson uh, and I were both interviewed for a PBS short documentary about his grandmother recently. Um, and we have gotten to know each other a little bit through that experience. Uh, and likewise, I had the great honor of getting to meet some of the Cameron family members. And uh, so anyways, thank you so much. And thank you, Stacy. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Great, thank you so much. That was, that was great, um, wonderful. So yes, we do have a question. Um, let's see, during your research, did you detect any sense of the white savior syndrome by the white women activists or did they center a sense of self-empowerment in their peers and residents? That is such a great question. So let me take a step back and say these were Victorian women and they were operating at a time when there was a great sense of social and cultural superiority on the part of white Christians. In fact, the whole idea of being a missionary in a sense was a, a belief in the superiority of um, that viewpoint. Uh, and so absolutely there were, um, there were words that some of these women would use to describe the residents of the home that we would wince from today and we would feel very uncomfortable with today. They would seem to be disparaging. Um, and it was very troublesome as a historian, as a writer to deal with that. And I do try to address that directly in the book. That said, what they were doing was also inspiring. And the white women were working right next to the Asian women for decades, they were living with them, they were working with them. Um, and I, I hope my story brings home the notion that, I mean, Dolly Cameron was buried next to Tian Fu Wu, who was her closest friend. So there, this is really a cross-cultural story of activists. That's how I see it. Um, so I hope I answered that question. Stacey, did I get all of it or did I miss some of it? Oh, no, that's that sounds about right. And I think uh, I was doing some research on your website and you actually wrote um, an article for the LA Times. I think it was an op-ed article about that that type of scenario about the um, the white savior. And I will yeah. um, put that in the follow up email I sent to everyone that registered. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stacy. And I would say that uh, one of the things that I've tried to do was to emphasize that Asian women were involved in this effort. And so even uh, if anything, it's previous looks at what happened at 920 Sacramento Street have certainly emphasized one woman, Donaldina Cameron. And my book, I hope, will put in the foreground uh, the Asian women who were very much involved in this project uh, from the very beginning. Great. Are there more questions? And if you would like to actually ask your question, if you can use the raise hand feature, I can definitely call on you and allow you to talk. All right, well, why we wait, I wanna, I, when I was doing some research, we have, um, the South San Francisco had a newspaper, <laughs> I mean, from 1895 to like the mid 1900s called the, um, the Enterprise. And there was actually an article about a raid that Miss Cameron went on and it detailed like going into the building and how she found the women down below into the deep ground. It was quite fascinating. I'll put a link to um, how they can find that on our website. But um, oh. Yeah, I, I was wondering how, how many, um, in your research, did you find other accounts of the various types of raids they went on or exactly what happened? So many accounts, Stacey. Um, the newspapers, of course, gobbled these stories up. They were, you know, they were just made for uh, uh, newspaper wars at the time. And there was, you know, 
splashy coverage with engraved, interesting, you know, illustrations of rooftop rescues and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, as well, there was other source material to reconstruct some of those um, events. For example, the, the women who ran the home did an annual report every single year. And sometimes they would use slightly flowery language as well uh, to describe their work, um, because of course they were in part fundraising with these reports. They were hoping that um, uh, generous donors would chip in and also the church authorities in New York uh, or Philadelphia would pick would chip in as well or help support the project even more. Um, but it was it was great because at least there was um, those annual reports over ye over how many years seventy years that I read and could study and then try to cross reference against the newspaper reports and against police reports if I could find them and against uh, National Archives um, immigration records sometimes and the house was involved very deeply in a in a, a case that uh, made headlines in the 1930s and it was then known as the broken blossoms case people still call it that um there's a great deep trove of records on this legal case uh in the national archives and involved a human trafficker operating out of a hardware store as a front on grant street in the 1930s and he had a whole syndicate of financial supporters and backers. Um, and they were bringing women in and selling them essentially. And he'd been doing it for decades. And so uh, while the newspapers covered that and the uh, home's own records covered that, I also had official documents covering that. I had the immigration records of the trafficker uh, and I had, um, you know, I had court transcripts and also interviews of uh, some of the uh, trafficked women who took refuge originally in the home and then uh, agreed to testify in court. Um, so uh, there are different layers of telling the same story and it's a very, very complex story to try to piece together because names changed, people disappeared. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a criminal enterprise where um, you know, I wish I could wave a magic wand and have all my questions answered, but I, you know, can't. The guy, the guy who was convicted, his name was Wong C. Duck, disappeared um, after, you know, he was deported and then it was very hard to track him down. And there were reports in the National Archives of spottings of him coming back into San Francisco, but that was never approved. Okay, um, we do have a question. Uh, can you tell us, uh, this person entered a little late into the, pre the presentation, sure. can you tell us what years there was active slavery in California? That's an excellent question. Um, well, it's a very, very broad question. And I think an easy and perhaps too glib answer would be that it's still going on. Um, certainly anti-trafficking activists would say there's still modern day slavery taking place here. Um, that said, this very specific type of slavery that I'm talking about, the so-called, you know, what was labeled the, the slave girl trafficking, um, flourished particularly in the 1860s to 1880s. That was really what we think was the height of it. Um, and in part due to more attention to this criminal practice taking place, um, it started to taper off after, uh, as we moved into the 20th century. But of course, that famous court case, that was all about human slavery as well, so. Okay, are there more questions? Okay. I'm, I'm so happy to answer questions privately too. So just, uh, you can find my website and it'll show you how to get in touch with me. And I love hearing from readers, so. Great, thank you. Um, well, if that's it, uh, oh, we do have something, let's see. Did your research show any cooperation for helping Chinese girls and women from other churches in Chinatown? Uh, absolutely. So there, 
the Presbyterians weren't the only denomination that was, was running a safe house in Chinatown at that time. The Methodists were doing the same thing. And in fact, the Methodists were the first to do it. Um, however, by the turn of the century, their project had kind of tapered out for the most part. Um, again, the um, to come and take refuge at 920 Sacramento Street, there was no condition. You didn't have to be a Presbyterian or, you, you know, there was, there was nothing like that. And there was a great deal of cooperation amongst the various church people, including Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterians, and others who were in Chinatown at the time and saw the social problem, the social problem of trafficking. And so they did come together and try, try to work together to some extent. For example, the Catholics opened up a, uh, a similar type home, but this, in this case, it was for vulnerable boys. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a few thank yous for everything. Um, I guess maybe to close this off, again, ask questions, type them in if you want, but um, the mission, Occidental Mission Home is still here. What's their current operations like? So what kind of service, do you know what kind of services they're providing now? Sure. Stacy. thanks for asking that question. I usually uh, mean to bring that up in my talk. Um, so it is now known as Cameron House, named in Dolly Cameron's honor, and it's still a very, very vital uh, social services and community hub in Chinatown to this day. Um, it during during the pandemic, it has continued to operate its food pantry, uh, and it serves low income people from around the neighborhood. Um, and it also, particularly during the summer, you'll see an enormous number of kids hanging out at Cameron House because there's a lots of um, kids after school programs and and summer programs that are going on. Uh, and um, aside from that, Cameron House is probably famous because it has been the site. It's got this tremendous playground area that overlooks the financial district. And so it's been the site of a number of uh, movie shoots over the years, uh, which is very cool, so. All right, so are there any other questions? I think I recall seeing that park now that you mention it. I haven't actually been to the building, but yeah. Um, all right, if you have any more questions, let us know, now's the time. Otherwise, I will put um, Julia's website in the follow-up email and you're, sounds like you're more than welcome to email her and she'll be happy to correspond with you. So um, at this point, I guess I'll just say thank you so much, Julia, for being with us today. Um, if you haven't read her book, please do so. Um, we have copies at the library. You can also purchase it from your local bookseller, I'm sure. Um, and uh, again, thank you. And uh, we hope to, if you have any other thing, any other books coming out soon that we should know about? Any other research you're working mm -hmm. on? You want to keep that quiet? <laughs> oh, Stacy, thank you so much for asking that question. I am working on a new book. Uh, again, I'm very fascinated with turn of the century stories involving women who defy the odds. Uh, so this will be another book with that, the exploring that theme. Okay. Uh, but in the current issue or the next issue of Ulta magazine, which is a fantastic uh, magazine devoted to the West, I have got a uh, feature story coming out about uh, one of the greatest unsolved murder mysteries mm. of our state, the state of California, and that is the unsolved murder of Jane Stanford, who was the co-founder of Stanford University. She was poisoned by strychnine. So uh, <laughs> the story goes from Hawaii to Knob Hill down to uh, the campus that is still today known as the farm to try to, you know, figure out who done it. So <laughs> that's what I've got coming out next. Okay, that sounds that sounds exciting. Um, thank you. All right, everyone. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Julia. I hope everyone has a uh, wonderful day. And um, we hope to see you all soon. Please visit the library because we are open. So thank you. <laughs> Bye, Stacy. Thanks all so right. much. Bye.